Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, corporate earnings in focus. We'll look ahead to results from the jet maker Boeing and shipping giant UPS. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Carolyn Hepke here in London, where we're charting the potential rise of British banking ahead of some key earnings reports. I'm Doug Krisner, looking ahead to next week's BRICS Summit, hosted by Russian President Vladimir Putin. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 929 Boston, DAB Digital Radio London, Sirius XM 121, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and the Bloomberg Business app. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby. We begin today's program with the troubled aerospace giant, Boeing, the company making headlines for all the wrong reasons of late. A crippling month-long strike, mounting losses, layoffs, investigations into the safety of its aircraft and more. And amid all that, Boeing officially reporting its third quarter earnings this Wednesday, although some of those numbers were released last week. Now, for more on what we can expect, we're joined by George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst. George, thanks for joining us. Well, before we talk about what's wrong at Boeing and maybe how to fix it, what do you expect to see from the Q3 earnings this Wednesday? Yeah, I think we've already seen, I think, the most important part of Q3 earnings. And um, that was when Boeing disclosed their cash balances and uh, and cash use for the quarter, right? So uh, during the quarter, we saw use of, it was about a a billion three. uh, So that was from operations. Uh, I think a little bit better than what we had expected for uh, for usage. Uh, there's going to be some capex that piles on top of that, which will uh, you know give us our free cash flow uh, for the quarter. Again, probably something close to two billion ish in use. They were down to about ten billion dollars in balances. I think it's ten and a half. Uh, and so this is a company that needs about ten billion dollars to run the business. So to, the big indicator here was that you know they're they're at the point where they need to. Uh, raise some money. Uh, speaking of raising money, now they're now working on raising upwards of $25 billion with new shares, convertible bonds. I mean, is this going to go ahead? It's credit rating just above junk status. Is this what's next for Boeing? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the company's calculus here is that if they're right up against the edge of what they need to run the company and they've got a strike going on, uh, you know, obviously there's going to be well, probably cash usage during the, the fourth quarter. So they need to go into the markets and shore up that that liquidity position just to give them more leverage with the union. And so uh, I do think it's going to uh, occur, right? We, uh, we've heard rumblings of them coming to the equity market for uh, up to $25 billion. They, they filed the shelf offering for $25 billion. I don't think they want to use all $25 billion right now. I don't think they want to be uh, I don't think they want to skimp either on what they get from the marketplace, right? I think they want a couple quarters worth of liquidity so they can get the union back to the table and say, look, we've got a lot of staying power here. So you better be ready to go, uh, you know, a quarter or more, uh, you know, on this strike, uh, which I think is going to be very hard, right, for the typical union rank and file. So, uh, you know, we kind of see 10 to 15 billion worth of cash raise. Uh, again, equity. The challenge will be that there'll be a fair amount of dilution uh, for current shareholders. Uh, there's about $90 billion of market cap right now in the company. $10 billion raise is something like 11% uh, dilution. So it's pretty significant. And that's why I think they don't want to go all the way to the $25 billion mark. I think equity sort of protects their credit rating or helps them uh, you know, with their credit rating, doesn't, doesn't deteriorate the, their credit metrics. I'm sure the ratings agencies are also concerned about the strike, so I'm not sure it gets them totally out of the woods on on pressure for their credit rating, but it, it's definitely a lot better than them raising debt, where I think the credit rating agencies would just have to downgrade them as soon as they did that. Yeah, yeah, and but and it could happen, right? It could again. Yeah. I think they're still under pressure for the for credit ratings. 
the agencies have clearly been looking past current problems, right? Because you couldn't do a, a net debt to EBITDA analysis on them right now, right? Their EBITDA is quite low and their, their debt's quite high. So the metrics are way out of whack. And, you know, the credit agencies are looking through this period. But the longer it goes on, the more they have to worry about the financial challenges at Boeing. And I think the less they can look through the period and, and have to take some action. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that strike. And I, I just want to be clear, this is just their Pacific Northwest manufacturing, right? There is manufacturing going on elsewhere? Yeah. So this is the machinists out of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they're responsible for, they build most of the uh, commercial programs for Boeing, right? So they they would build the 767, they'd build the 777, they'd build the 737. Uh, of those airplanes, the 737 is the most important airplane to Boeing commercial. That's the highest volume. It's where they generate their cash, make the profits out of. So that's why this strike is so debilitating to the company. They do manufacture 787s. I think their second most important commercial platform. They make them in the Car- in uh, South Carolina near Charleston. That's a non-union plant, so it's not affected. There is, you know, what I've heard in the mar- marketplace is some of those 787s come back up to Everett, Washington and get worked a bit before they go to customers. So we're not going to say that they're not impacted at all by the strike, but I think they have the capability to continue to deliver in decent numbers close to their targets, that 787 during the strike. And then the defense network really isn't affected except for KC-46 tanker. KC-46 tanker is the U.S. aerial tanker program. Another program Boeing's had a lot of problems on, taking a lot of charges on. The airframe goes down a line in the northwest, in the Seattle area, up in Everett. Uh, and and I think that's largely uh, machinists and union labor. And so that's probably impacted as well by the, by the strike. But a large portion of defense is not affected by the strike. Not affected. Wow. Well, Boeing's latest earnings this Wednesday ahead of Wall Street's opening bell. Our thanks to George Ferguson, Bloomberg Intelligence, Senior Aerospace, Defense, and Airlines Analyst. We move next to the shipping and logistics company, United Parcel Service, UPS, reporting its third quarter earnings on Thursday. Now, UPS coming off a pretty rough second quarter after a drop in volume. Will the third quarter be any different? For more, we're joined by Lee Klaskow, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Transport, Logistics, and Shipping Analyst. So, Lee, thank you for being here. What do you expect to see in UPS's third quarter earnings this week? Well, I think this print's going to be a much better print than we've seen uh, in the first half of the year. In the third quarter, revenues are supposed to be up about mid-single digits. Uh, same with earnings per share. That's good news, um, you know, because we're seeing earnings growth again, and we expect that to really accelerate into 2025. And a lot of that has to do with what the company has been doing through its pricing initiatives. Uh, the company has set a number of different surcharges, whether it's a volume-specific surcharge, whether it's you know charging uh, more for weird shape or heavy freight um, that's not really conveyable. So it's, it, it adds cost for UPS. Uh, and then they're also, you know, they're constantly doing, you know, not constantly, but once a year they do a general rate increase or a GRI. Uh, and there's one on December 23rd uh, that's around 5.9%. And, and we expect, you know, historically UPS, FedEx, uh, DHL, you know, they tend to heavily discount their GRIs. And, and we, we expect those discounts to be a lot less this time around, just given all the labor inflation, equipment inflation that they need to uh, mitigate uh, through pricing initiatives. Now, that labor inflation you spoke about, they had settled, avoided a strike. Yes. And but it really cost them, didn't it? It did, and you know it was front loaded, uh, and that's something else that will benefit. And then the second half, uh, the comparables will become a lot easier uh, for them uh, on that longer term contract w- with the Teamsters. So so that is good news, and you know now they know kind of what their um, costs are going to be as it relates to labor, and they can work through that. And the company's been doing a lot of different things in terms of increasing the overall productivity. They've also focusing more on some of what they would, I guess, deem their core business. They recently sold their uh, freight brokerage business, which is co- uh, called Coyote. They sold that to RxO, uh, uh, and, and, and that should be a, a huge win for RxO because they can really take that business maybe a lot further than UPS did because it really wasn't a focus for UPS management over the years. It was more of a complementary business that probably works better outside of the UPS. But they also made some acquisitions, correct? Mexico 
They do a lot of tuck-in acquisitions and a lot of the acquisitions that they're doing. Um, they're trying to get kind of longer into the supply chain, if you will. Um, so, you know, some of the, those acquisitions, they've done a lot in the healthcare industry. Healthcare is a is a very interesting industry from a logistics standpoint um, because it, it comes with higher margins. There's a lot of specialties that go on. I'm sure everyone remembers during the pandemic, you know, when we had the vaccines distributed, they had to be super, super cold. Uh, and, you know, those kind of services cost a lot more money. Uh, than uh, sending an envelope overseas, and therefore it usually comes with higher margins. So it's usually a, it's a very good business. And UPS and FedEx are also looking at you know um, a step down from the enterprise market, so the small to medium sized shipper, which tend to have better margins as well. So UPS, while they're divesting some businesses, um, they're leaning into other businesses uh, through these bolt on acquisitions. Now, I want to talk, go back to something you said about the surcharges. Consumers are definitely pulling back on their money. FedEx has said, uh, UPS maybe has said the same thing, that people are choosing a cheaper option, ground transportation instead of air freight to save money. I mean, is, is that being offset by the, these higher surcharges? And, and what does that mean as we head into the most important season for, for them, you know, the holiday season? Yeah, so I mean, we're definitely seeing a trade down effect. Uh, to your point, so it maybe instead of having expedited freight or freight that or a package that has to go overnight, maybe people are willing to take three or five days. Uh, I know personally, anecdotally, you know, when I when I'm doing online shopping, there's a lot more options there, like of not having it overnight. And usually, when it's not overnight, then it's usually free, and I'm always going to pick the free option. Always, uh, always, o- only always, <laughs> always. I mean, I don't need the pair of pants that bad. Right. I can wait a week. And so, you know, you are seeing that. You're also seeing an interesting shift. So, you know, we talked earlier that volumes are expected to increase mid single digits for the domestic market and slightly up for their international market. Um, Some of that volume growth is coming out of China with these relatively new uh, e-commerce providers like uh, Sheen and and Timu. Uh, And and that's interesting because they're kind of going under the radar with some um, duties where there's a de minimis rule. I know this is getting a little wonky now, where uh, if if the value of the product's under $800, they don't face uh, an extra duty. And so a lot of freight is coming in from China because you know, without a, a duty, and it's and it's a lot cheaper, and kind of undercutting maybe things that people could buy here in the United States. So the Biden administration is looking at that, and that that could change some volumes um, on a negative aspect because it, it's been a good area of growth for the FedExes and the UPSs of the world. Well, UPS third quarter earnings out this Thursday. That's ahead of Wall Street's opening bell. Our thanks to Lee Klaskow, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Transport Logistics and Shipping Analyst. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we'll chart the potential rise of British banking with some prominent UK banks reporting their latest earnings. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, we'll look ahead to the 16th annual BRICS Summit in Russia. But first, ahead of upcoming earnings from some of the UK's largest banks like Lloyd's and Barclays, analysts are turning more positive on the sector. Jefferies, UBS, and Goldman all bullish on British banking shares. Can the results live up to the expectations? For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Caroline Hepker. Tom, the boost to British banking brought about by high interest rates could linger longer than thought. Analysts are turning positive on the likes of NatWest and Lloyds, citing the rewards of what they call the structural hedge, hundreds of billions of pounds invested in the swaps market to reduce sensitivity to interest rate movements. There's also a new government in town, if you hadn't noticed, one determined to bolster growth and bring in investment. That's something that UK banks should be poised to profit from. Bloomberg has been speaking to Lloyd's CEO, Charlie Nunn, at the UK Investment Summit recently. Nunn told Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix that he is optimistic about Britain's future. Well, I think the really important thing to get more investment in the UK is firstly uh, clarity and a clear direction for the country. And so 
the stability and the clarity this government's trying to give, I think, is really important. Investors want to invest in the UK. They're looking at the UK relative to Europe and the US and Asia. And at the moment, the UK looks like a good destination. But the first thing is clarity and stability. The second thing is, tell me where you're going to invest alongside us and do it in a way that enables us to bring private capital to work. We estimate that there's about 40 to 50 billion pounds worth of investment per year for the next 20 years. So the government can't afford that, but the private sector really can make a difference. And then the third thing is, really enable the financial services sector to unlock its potential to support that investment. But, uh, Charlie, so you're one of the key components actually to try and get this foreign direct investment into the country. Where would you deploy it? Where will it be deployed? Well, I know the government's going to come out with their kind of industrial plan, and they're talking about eight sectors. Uh, two examples that I think there's huge opportunity. One is around the energy transition, and the UK is already a leader around offshore wind, but floating wind, onshore wind, the growth in solar, and then some of the new technologies like carbon capture and hydrogen. There's huge opportunities to invest. And that also needs a clear plan for the national grid and the electric electrical infrastructure. That's one example of a huge opportunity for investment. Another is housing. So uh, the government's made a commitment to build 1.5 million new homes. We need more social and affordable homes specifically. That's something we have called for as Lloyds Banking Group. And we really need to get the money invested to start um, going behind, breaking down the planning laws and building more homes. And that'll be good for jobs and productivity and create an environment that we can get the skills for the investment in business. But, uh, Charlie, so I guess a lot of people are concerned by the fact that, of course, this government needs banks, as you say, to bring in private capital, to deploy some of the money, to help them actually also help with the National Wealth Fund. At the same time, they're talking about taxing the, the banks. So how do you square the two? Well, obviously, taxation is um, a matter for the government to talk about. But irrespective of whatever kind of political decision they take on that, you know, as Lloyds Banking Group is an example, we've got a £900 billion balance sheet. We do £80 to £100 billion worth of lending per year. We have £200 billion worth of pension assets we manage on behalf of Britain pensioners. We need to put that money to work. And then we partner with some of the biggest world's pension funds, private credit funds. And our job is to bring our expertise to ch channel that into the UK. So there's huge opportunity for us to continue to deploy that capital in smarter ways that drives productivity, growth and jobs. Um, to get the UK economy to being the fastest growth economy in the G7, which is a really bold ambition. A, a number of your competitors, NatWest and Barclays, have done recent acquisitions showing basically that they really support this economy. Are you looking to do something likely as well? So, you know, we, we are now three years into the five-year strategy I laid out, and the great news is it's very much a growth strategy, and we're delivering well against that. We're going to do an update in February next year on the first checkpoint in that strategy, and I'm really pleased with the progress we've made. We've done some Bolton acquisitions, but the core of our strategy is an organic growth strategy. And the great thing for Lloyds Banking Group is we are typically the number one or number two player in every segment and product we participate in including, in fact, an investment in the UK, project finance, infrastructure finance, housing finance, where we lead in the UK. So, um, no, we'll look at acquisitions opportunistically. Our core strategy is organic, and uh, we're feeling good about where we're going. What do you want on pensions? Pensions, but also there's a lot of talk on actually risk-taking, and this takes years, not months, that the government has. Yeah, so pensions are such an important part of the puzzle. As I said, we are a leading pensions provider in the UK, £200 billion worth of pension money. Um, and I think there's a few things that really matter. The first is we need to get more of our customers' money into pensions. About 40% of the UK households aren't on track for even a basic living standard. And obviously, giving them financial resilience is good for the economy. Um, so we need to increase enrolment around pensions. The second thing is how can we invest it safely and appropriately for them in high-risk assets? And actually, that's more about conduct risk and fiduciary risk than it is around changing uh, or asking the investment managers to invest more in those kinds of projects. We need to look at how do you support customers to make those choices in this country. And that's something we're talking closely with the government and the regulators about. You know the new investment minister. How many questions do you think she'll field from international investors about the budget? Is this investment summit a little bit too soon as we don't really know what happens to non-DOMs, what happens also to carried interest, and other questions? Well, no, and the first thing to say is you can hear the buzz in the room today. Um, it's great to see the excitement about investing in the UK and to have the international investors here. Um, it's very, very early days for the new investment minister, I think four or five days in. Um, I, I know her ambition is to increase overseas investment into the UK. And the kind of investors we're talking about are the big international pension funds, the big international sovereign wealth funds, the private credit funds. 
and they're going to be looking for good projects with a good return with a government and a country that's getting behind making those investments successful. That's what will matter. It won't be some of the things you're talking about. And so I hope that she's really focused on engaging those kinds of organisations and then working with you know, our financial services sector, which has the expertise to put that money to work. And we're the leading financial service sector in the world, let me say that. That was Lloyds Bank CEO Charlie Nunn, perhaps Keir Starmer managing to calm the city's jitters with that investment summit ahead of the autumn budget. So what is driving the positive trajectory of the UK banking sector? It's something that I've been talking to our finance reporter about, Harry Wilson. I think there's a few things. Obviously, we're now heading into a interest rate cutting cycle and people are looking at what, what impact that's going to have on credit demand. So obviously, on the one hand, falling interest rates aren't that great for banks as they cut their, their margins. But on the other hand, you could see a increase in, in demand for among customers for loans, and that can be positive in its own sense for the banks. So it's really kind of a, a trade-off there between, between those things. And then I, I think we also... Obviously, we're looking out to what the new government is going to mean for the banking sector. So far, it's been broadly positive, but obviously we're waiting for the budget in uh, in the coming weeks. Yeah, absolutely. How's the sector performed uh, to date? So we've just come off Wall Street Bank earnings, uh, which have been very strong. How is the sector in the UK performing? Well, the share price has been very strong this year. So among a number of the banks, we've got double digit increases, you know, just to take one. But um, something like Barclays is up around about 55 percent at the moment. Lloyd's up nearly 30%, NatWest over 60%. The one, the, one of the laggards, uh, uh, relative laggards, is, is HSBC. They're, they're less than less than about uh, 8% at the moment. But generally, the, the sector's been having a very good year. And so then, um, in terms of what we're expecting to come, obviously rate-sensitive stocks like banks are in focus when it comes to interest rates. The Bank of England um, has seen inflation fall below the 2% target for the first time since what? 2021, April 2021. How do you think that will affect banks, the loosening of central bank policy, the Bank of England cutting interest rates? I think one of the things we'll probably have to be looking out for is particularly what banks say around cost cuts. So as as I mentioned, um, the cuts to interest rates are actually, you know, not seen that positively for banks, particularly because it cuts into their margins. So what we'll be then looking for is how banks adapt to that. So you know, take one example, but we've certainly seen at HSBC a lot of uh, talk and speculation around potential cost cuts. As the bank looks to, you know, they're coming off a period in which they've had outsized earnings. You know, this year, or sorry, last year was um, a record year for their, their annual profits. And so now that we're, that's likely to dampen, I think the focus among the banks is probably going to be on how do we cut our expenses, given that we're probably going to be expecting some kind of margin compression now in the coming years. Also, as you say, ahead of the budget on the 30th of October, we did hear from some British um, leading bankers, including the CEO of Barclays, at the UK Investment Summit um, only a few days ago. Has the new government done something to bolster this uh, sector? I mean, Barclays was really quite positive on, on the UK, on investing in the UK. What's the interplay between this new government and, and bankers in Britain? It's very early days, so it, it's it's hard to say exactly what we're going to get. I mean, I, I think everything kind of rests on, on the budget. Obviously, if there's some particularly harsh tax rises for banks, then that could definitely weigh on the sector. I think at the moment, both sides are, are feeling themselves out, you know, basically trying to get a sense of what, what the other's about. And, and I don't think, uh, as yet, that there's any sort of particular sign that Labour's going to be that harsh on banks. But on the other hand, you know, if we were to see some kind of new bank tax in, in the budget, um, that could probably quite rapidly change sentiment. Yeah, indeed. What are you on the lookout for in terms of which of the banks might be of most interest to you? HSBC is the obvious, I think the, probably the most interesting one at the moment. We've got a new CEO. This is going to be his first set of results and there's an expectation now of some kind of at least minor restructuring of, of the business, probably some uh, major divisions being combined, but also what, what they say about expenses and the future strategy of the bank. For me, HSBC is, go- is going to be the one to watch this quarter. Th- that said, I think Barclays could be an interesting one. We've seen uh, in the last few days, we've seen some very strong results out of Wall Street. We've seen some very strong trading results Barclays is the UK bank with the highest exposure to Wall Street. So this is 
clearly going to be good news for Barclays, and and you you get the sense that they could have quite a quite a good set of numbers um, mm. come Q threes. CS Vane Katakrishnan talked about the US election posing risks globally, geopolitics posing risks globally. Um, how do you think banks are thinking about the election outcome in the US? Is that a risk factor? I think banks are relatively sanguine about it. Uh, you know, they, they, they tend to take the view that who, whoever wins these elections, that they'll adapt to whatever comes from it. And certainly as, as a sector, banks have proved pretty adaptable over the years, whatever's been thrown at them, whether it's market crashes or whether it's um, changes in, in governments. I, I think they'll probably, as they've always done, go with the flow. So it's hard to say if, if one outcome is particularly negative for them. I mean, you know, as a general rule, it, particularly if you've got strong trading operations, a period of volatility actually turns out to be pretty good for, for business. If uh, a Trump election led to a lot of market volatility, I think that could be something that the banks would obviously could well profit from. Many thanks to my Bloomberg colleague, Harry Wilson, there for talking us through uh, the outlook for the banking sector in the UK. I'm Caroline Hepke here in London, and you can catch us every weekday morning for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London. That's 1am on Wall Street. Tom. Thanks, Caroline. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the BRICS Group of Nations hold their 16th annual summit in Russia next week. We'll have more on what to expect. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. The BRICS Group of Nations will hold their 16th annual summit in Russia next week. Let's turn now to Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast host Doug Krisner for a closer look. Tom, in the coming week, Russian President Vladimir Putin will be hosting the BRICS Summit. This year's summit is especially important because new members will be added. The founders, that would be Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, will formally welcome four new countries. They are Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates. Now, Saudi Arabia has been invited to join. It will be represented by its foreign minister. It seems like Russia in particular is intent on expanding this alliance to counter the influence of the West, both economically and politically. So for a closer look, let's bring in Bloomberg Saleh Mosin, a senior Washington correspondent on the U.S. EcoGov team joining us from the nation's capital. So, Leia, thank you for making time to chat with us. Can we start by taking a step back and looking broadly at BRICS? Is it helpful to look at this alliance as basically a countervailing force to the G7? That is a, a really interesting way to look at it. Absolutely. Uh, the G7 is knitted around Western countries. It is U.S.-led and it's been uh, a force of power for quite a while. And they these are countries that work together. They work together through uh, the global financial crisis, through COVID, uh, and most recently through the uh, Russia invasion on Ukraine and falling in line with US-led economic sanctions on Russia. And that's the very thing that triggered a stronger bond uh, across the BRICS and now BRICS plus nations. And so there is a reactive force there. It's the U.S.-led coalition and the China-led coalition. The relationship between the BRICS countries, though, is interesting because they don't always all get along. Mm. But when it comes to finding a way around the dollar, they found some common ground. We can talk about the dollar in a moment. Let's talk a little bit about the internal dynamics as we know them or as we understand them. You mentioned... Uh, kind of maybe not seeing eye to eye. On one hand, we have Brazil and India, democracies. I think we can agree on that. Russia, China, autocracies. I'm imagining that that creates a, a bit of internal rivalry, does it not? Absolutely. Uh, Russia and China are running their countries very differently. There's always question about what would happen when there is an eventual power transfer at hand. Uh, Brazil and India, they have very different um, interests at hand. And then the countries that you named that are now joining include a lot of oil producing nations. Mm. And so those stakes are different than what the other countries have. 
Yeah, both Saudi Arabia, although it's only been invited to join, the UAE, which has been given membership, and then Iran. So you're absolutely right not to leave out Russia in terms of oil producers. We've got two major military conflicts happening. We've got Israel conducting war in Gaza, and on the northern border with Lebanon, Israel is fighting Hezbollah. How are these conflicts likely to enter the conversation? The two sets of conflicts, on the one hand, it's kinetic war, uh, you know, bombs and blasts going on in, in those two major conflicts. And then on the other hand, between the China-led coalition and the U.S. coalition, it's a proxy war through economic uh, and diplomatic uh, channels. And both ways are damaging. Both um, types of wars are just proof that the decades-old global order uh, established uh, when the when World War II came to a close has started to come apart. And so you'll hear a lot more about uh, global or geoeconomic fragmentation, which is coming against the backdrop of economic populism and protectionism popping up in a lot of uh, across the globe, including the United States. We have two presidential candidates, two parties. Both of them have become protectionist parties. And so we have overlapping and coinciding forces pulling apart the global order. The other military conflict that we have to address is the Russian occupation of Ukraine. I mentioned at the top of the conversation that this summit will be hosted by Russian President Vladimir Putin. To what extent is he going to try to gather more support for what is happening, uh, Russia's intentions in Ukraine? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think having allies, particularly with it, Russia, the Russia's relationship with India and China, is important for Vladimir Putin right now. Uh, China has come out a little bit more strongly in support of Russia. India is still trying to toe the line a little bit. But those relationships have limits to them, mm. right? If you just take one example, that is that Russia uh, was able to sell a lot of its oil to India when the US-led coalition put a lot of caps on the amount of oil, Russian oil that could reach markets. And Vladimir Putin after that ended up with a lot of Indian rupees. And he did not know what to do with them because he cannot take that and, and buy the things he needs. And so it didn't have the same exchangeability value. And we're seeing similar data come through on the Russia-China relationship. But that being said, that's the technical sort of weedy stuff diplomatically, it's been hugely beneficial for Russia to have a block of nations that is supporting it in various levels of strength across the spectrum. Saleh, I'd like to pivot to how the dollar plays into all of this. We've talked in the past, you and I, about de-dollarization, whether the dollar is really under threat right now as the world's reserve currency. We can talk about the challenges that you may see in a minute. First, I want to listen to a segment of a recent Bloomberg News interview with former President Donald Trump where the dollar was discussed. Here is Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. Can I ask you a particular thing about the dollar? You've actually you talked about wars. At the New York Economic Club, you said that if you lost the dollar as a reserve currency, it would be like America losing a war. Yeah. You look at what you're going to do in terms of protectionism. Oh, you drive be... countries to use the other yeah. currencies. Yeah. And all that debt is also going to lessen the dollar's status as a, the world's reserve currency. If Do I'm you worry about the that? the dollar is so secure, your reserve currency is the strongest it'll ever be. The reserve currency is under threat because you have Iran, you have Russia, you have China. Once China is the one that you have to worry about because they want it. Yeah. They want to have the yuan be the the, the you yes. know thing of power. So here's what I'm doing. Again, I hate to go back to it. If somebody says, and I know countries want to get out because they don't respect our leadership, they look at this guy, they say, you've got to be kidding, and she's worse than him. By the way, she's, I never thought I'd say this, she is not as smart as Biden, if you can believe it. This is not what, we had four years of this, this, this lunacy, and we can't have it anymore. We're not going to have a country left. Okay, currency, very important. Yes. And if you want to go to third <laughs> world, if you want to go to third world status, lose your reserve currency. We have to have that. We cannot lose it. If you go to you'll go to third world status in this country because you take a look at the way things are running. If a country tells me, uh, sir, we like you very much, but we're going to no longer adhere to being in the reserve currency. Uh, we're not going to uh, salute the dollar anymore. I'll say that's OK. And uh, you're going to pay a 100 percent tariff on everything you 
sell into the United States. And we love your product. I hope you sell a lot of it into the United States, but you're going to pay 100 percent tariff. Uh, he will then follow it up by saying, sir, it would be an honor to stay with the reserve currency. I will be that will be like just playing. That's not even chess. That's checkers. Former President Trump there in conversation uh, with Bloomberg editor in chief John Micklethwaite. Let's bring in Bloomberg Saleh Mosin, who has been talking with me about the upcoming uh, BRICS summit in Russia. Saleh, you've written a lot about de-dollarization. Was there anything in that conversation that you want to push back against? Well, one thing is that Trump is, I mean, yeah, he's right that countries are talking about moving away from the dollar, but he's wrong that any country has actually actively abandoned the dollar. No one has. If you just, I'll just give you two data points. 88% of the world's foreign exchange transactions take place in the dollar. The biggest rival that people talk about is China. And that's who Trump by name has said is is gunning to, to, to drop the dollar and make the its own yuan the reserve asset. Their figure, their equivalent figure is 7% of global foreign exchange transactions. So it's a very big disparity. So no one has abandoned the dollar, and it's actually hard to abandon the dollar. There's no clear alternative. The U.S. is so large and so deeply entrenched in the global system with its currency that dropping the dollar would be like the lingua franca not no longer being English. English is no longer the universal language. Dollar is no longer the universal currency, right? That's how difficult it, it is. So maybe we can call it aspirational to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. That said, could the dollar's dominance be challenged even in a small way that could maybe provide a little bit of disruption? You know, one thing that's important to state is that um, the U.S. and U.S. officials should not be complacent. And Trump is showing that he would not be complacent with any discussion about um, countries wanting to come together and move away from the dollar because it is such a privileged uh, status for the U.S. And every everyone who lives in the U.S., every consumer benefits from that status. And then companies and countries around the world benefit from that, too. The biggest threat to the dollar's dominance is not externally that any other country could take over or or ditch the dollar. Really, the threats come from internal problems are massive debt and, and deficits, the uh, some of the playing chicken with our um, public financing issues, uh, making sure that no one is abusing the privileged position that the dollar gives us in the world which is basically saying let's not overuse sanctions, let's not overuse the dollar as a tool. Um, Those are a couple of the key components to remember there. Now, former President Trump in the conversation with John Micklethwaite was uh, mentioning the Chinese currency, the yuan. Right now, given everything that's going on in China, the challenges that the economy has been confronted with, that seems like a long shot, doesn't it? It is a long shot. Um, China is, yes, the second largest uh, economy in the world, but it's number two by a large, large gap. It would take numbers two, three, and four. So China, Japan, and Germany to come together, and then you can be bigger than the U.S. in terms of economic size. The other piece to add there is that um, China does not have the transparency and democratic values that investors have been accustomed to for 80 years now in the world's reserve asset. The reason that investors flee to the dollar and U.S. assets in times of trouble or turmoil is because they know that it is uh, underpinned by a strong democracy. We have independent institutions, free and fair elections, rule of law. And unless and, and because investors are not conditioned to expect this, it will take a lot for investors to change that. And I don't see that happening overnight. And on top of that, the Chinese currency is not free floating. It's managed, very managed by the PBOC. Exactly. That comes down to the transparency angle. Uh, It's not market forces that determine uh, where the currency is at and what is going on in the economy. It's also still largely a managed economy. Saleya, thank you so much for making time to uh, help us preview the BRICS Summit in the week ahead. Bloomberg Saleya Mosin, senior Washington correspondent. She's also the author of Paper Soldiers, How the Weaponization of the Dollar Changed the World Order. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join us weekdays for the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, where we dive into the stories moving markets in the APAC region. It's available wherever you get your podcast. Tom?
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.